Hello, ladies and gentlemen, we are very pleased to welcoming you to the Medi Veins 2020 webinar, Varicose Veins, which therapy option do we have? We are proud and honored that we have four international key opinion leaders, which will give you their presentations. The speakers are first Professor Eberhard Rabe, followed by Dr. Attilio Cavezzi, and afterwards Dr. Nick Morrison from the USA, and finally Dr. Giovanni Mosti from Italy. In addition to this, we are pleased to welcome more than 500 participants all over the world. Due to the current time differences, for example, in China, Australia, Japan. It is already late at night for some of you as participants. Therefore, special thanks to you from these countries, especially our colleagues and friends, uh, Christine, Genta-san, Midori and Alex from Australia. Thank you for your great motivation and passion for this webinar. After each presentation, you can ask your questions or give us your comments or remarks. In addition, we will record the complete session for you. Let's all enjoy together the nice presentations. The first speaker is Professor Eberhard Rabe. His topic is natural history of varicose veins. Professor Rabe was 15 years president of the German Society of Phlebology and Four years he was past UIP World President Phlebology. Currently, he is president of the ECOP European College of Phlebology. His most famous study is the Bonn Vein study, with a lot of people appreciate all over the world. So please, Ebert, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, now you should see my slides. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I don't see my own slides. Just a second, okay. Uh, my topic today is natural history of varicose veins, as you have heard uh, before. And if you look to the SIP based studies we have in the recent years, we can see that varicose veins and chronic venous disease is uh, uh, very frequent in our general population. So if you look to C2 and C3 patients, for instance, varicose veins with and without edema, approximately 25% of our worldwide population uh, has uh, C2 and C3 stages, and approximately 5% have a severe chronic venous insufficiency. If we, oops, if you now look just to varicose veins, because that is the main topic, and these are data from the Bonn Vein study in, in Germany, in a general population of 18 to 79 years of age, the prevalence of varicose veins is 23.2%. That means a quarter of our population has varicose veins increasing with age. And the incidence of varicose veins per year is 2.1% per year which is also quite a high number. So the question is, what do we really know about natural history and progression of varicose veins? Uh, because there are not so many studies answering that. Let's first have a look to the natural history of reflux. And we have data from uh, the recent follow-up of the Edinburgh Vein study by Robert Robertson, published by Robertson in 2014. And uh, they looked to their Edinburgh Vein study patient 13 years after the initial um, investigation. And the incidence of reflux in these 13 years was 12.7% uh, or 0.9% per year. The 13-year incidence of isolated superficial reflux was 8.8 .8 compared to 2.6 of isolated deep venous reflux and 1.3% were combined. The risk factors, uh, interestingly, were not age 
or sex, but higher incidence of an overweight persons and after deep venous thrombosis, of course. Nikos Labropoulos could show in already in 2005 that if you have varicose veins and you are waiting for varicose vein surgery and he looked in 116 limbs, then 14.7% had extension of the pre-existing reflux. So it's not a stable situation, but it's uh, progressing. And 12.1% had reflux in a new segment. Uh, that means uh, varicose veins are developing if you are not treating them. Interestingly, Costas, of, uh, he showed a very nice study because he looked in the contralateral limb in 73 patients undergoing varicose vein surgery on the other limb. So the contralateral limb had no varicose veins before. And he could show that after five years, there were 48 sites, new sites of reflux. That means 52% or 10.4% per year. 50% of patients with unilateral varicosities develop chronic venous disease in the contralateral initially asymptomatic limb within five years, which is a quite a high number. Every second patient developed varicose veins in the other limb. And the independent risk factors were obesity and autostatism, and interestingly also non-compliance with compression, but this was not a prospective randomized study, but a, a retrospective study. So if you want to know the interesting question, how do varicose veins develop? Do they develop in the groin first or in side branches or distally or proximally? This is an interesting uh, study by Engelhorn already from 2012, and he investigated initial disease patients, 92 women with C1 and C2 disease, and he looked by duplex ultrasound to the great and small saphenous vein with a long follow-up of 33 months. And he looked for the patterns he could show in the different uh, time signs. And you can see here that this kind of segmental reflux was the predominant finding in the beginning. So in the first intervention, in the first uh, investigation, and that uh, changed to multi-segmental reflux like this one and this one uh, in the follow-up after 33 months. So th there was a change from 26 to 40 percent and from 41 back to 28 percent from segmental reflux to multi-segmental reflux. Uh, the reason for that might be that varicose veins develop first segmentally and then with a, after some time more segments join and at the end you have a diffuse complete a great saphenous or small saphenous varicose vein. Uh, very similar Bernardi, Bella Bernardini in Italy, he looked for the follow-up study of 104 limbs with varicose veins who had refused varicose vein surgery and they followed them for four years. And they could show that 94% showed a progression of reflux in these four years. In most of the cases, loc localization of reflux progressed from lower to more proximal localizations, suggesting an ascending progression of venous pathology, uh, very similar to the Engelhorn uh, findings. Kajati did a very interesting study, also from Italy. He looked to two groups of patients, those below 30 years of age and those above 60 years of age. So a young population and an old population. And he could show that in the young population, more, there was more non-saphenous varicose veins and more isolated tributaries and not so much great saphenous, complete great saphenous vein insufficiencies. If you look to the saphenous varicose veins in the group one in the younger population, there were only 39% which had saphenous varicose vein insufficiencies. But in the older group, it was 62% uh, with uh, great saphenous vein or great and small saphenous vein varicosities. Their suggestion was that from this old theory, 
were very constrained to develop from above to below, first in the groin, in the greater venous vein, and then the greater venous vein insufficiency uh, becomes extends also to the side branches. Now it seems that the ascending form of varicose veins from side branches, uh, then with time also to the saphenous veins, plays a more important role than we thought a long time ago. If you look to the natural history of signs and symptoms of venous disease following varicose veins, uh, we see this study of Brewster. This is also interesting historically from 1991, when in Great Britain there were very long waiting lists for varicose vein surgery, and they looked to 304 patients. And after four years, 64% uh, reported a progression of the disease and 5.2% developed complications like superficial vein thrombosis. 22% developed skin changes, meaning chronic venous insufficiency, and 12% developed venous leg ulcers. So there is quite a progression, not only in reflux, but also in the chronic venous disease itself. Uh, Labropoulos could show that this is more prominent in secondary chronic venous disease, post-thrombotic syndrome, for instance, shows more development of skin changes, 11 of 46 uh, patients uh, uh, compared to three in 50 patients with primary chronic venous disease with varicose veins. Uh, that is understandable because the hemodynamic changes in the deep venous system after post-thrombotic syndrome or after deep venous thrombosis might be more prominent. Robertson did a nice study, a case control study in 120 patients, and he wanted to know which of the varicose vein patients uh, develop uh, venous ulcers and which are the risk factors for venous ulcers in varicose vein patients. And he compared those patients which had C5 and C6 disease and varicose veins and those varicose vein patients with no history of venous leg ulcers. And his independent risk factors in multivariate analysis are lipodermatosclerosis, eczema, so skin changes, higher body mass index, so the obese population has a much higher risk for venous leg ulcers in varicose vein patients, and also popliteal vein reflux uh, in this population. And interestingly, I show you this a little bit later also, Corona phlebectatica, which has now been joined to the C classification, uh, also is a high risk factor with an odds ratio of 4.5 for the development of venous leg ulcers in varicose vein patients. In the one vein study, we investigated the population of 3,072 uh, participants from the general population, 18, aged 18 to 79 years, and we looked also for in a follow-up investigation after 6.7 years. And you can see that in this time, one way in study one and two, there is of course an increase in the C stages, C2, C3, C4, and 5 and 6. And if you look um, to the varicose vein population, the one way in study one, looking just to saphenous varicose veins, you can see that those who have been classified C2 developed C3 and C4 changes in, a, uh, in, an, in an incidence of 31.8% in those uh, 6.7 years, uh, which is 4.8% per year progression of pure varicose veins towards chronic venous insufficiency. And this happens also in non saphenous varicose veins, not only in saphenous varicose veins. Risk factors for that, very similar, are swelling sensation, body mass, a high body mass index, and also age in our population. Let's have a look to Corona phlebectatica, which after many years, first described by van der Molen in the 1950s, now came also in the viewpoint of the C classification after we did a lot of studies and um, discussions on that. And this typical sign of a chronic venous insufficiency 
as it was described by Van der Molen, as I said, is, or is a risk factor uh, for the progression of varicose veins towards chronic venous insufficiency. And we looked in the bone brain study, you can see that a severe corona, like in the picture, has a relative risk of 5.23, significantly with the, with the confidence interval between three and seven, uh, for the development uh, for varicose veins towards uh, cro clinical chronic, chronic venous insufficiency. And if you look to the progression of varicose veins in the follow-up uh, of the uh, um, Edinburgh vein study, which the picture which I showed you in the beginning for reflux, you can see that the progression rate in trunk varicose veins or in chronic venous insufficiency was 57.8%. So almost two thirds of the population of the Edinburgh vein study developed a progression from varicose veins or CVI within 13.4 years. And very similar to the bone vein study, as to say. And if you look to trunk varicose veins only at baseline, one third of this population had a progression towards chronic venous insufficiency. And the risk factors were family history, previous DVT, and again, overweight uh, population. Now, what happens if you treat varicose veins? So usually we would say, okay, we just have to treat varicose veins early enough, and then we can stop uh, progression and people, people will not, not have uh, varicose veins anymore. This is a nice study for another reason done by my colleague Ingo Flesselkemper from Germany. He compared three different kinds of ablation of great saphenous varicose veins, high ligation stripping, endovenous laser ablation, and a combination of laser ablation and high ligation. And he followed those patients up to six years in the follow-up. And you can see that uh, there is no difference in the three different groups for clinical uh, recurrent uh, varicose veins, but you can also see that there is recurrent varicose veins after time. And nicely to see, this is pre-operative. You see all these varicose vein population here, and some have also edema, some have skin changes like these ones. And immediately, two months after the operation, there is almost no more varicose veins. It's all gone because it's all either operated or laser ablated or whatsoever. And then after six months, it's almost the same. But after 12 months, it starts again to have uh, uh, recurrent varicose veins or new varicose veins. It's not only recurrent varicose veins in the same side, but most of it is recurrent varicose veins in other sides. And if you follow those patients for six years, you can see that after six years, you have again about 30 to 40 percent recurrent varicose veins uh, at all. You know, not, as I said, in the same side, but most of it in other regions of the legs. So this is a chronic disease you know, which uh, we can treat easily, but which has also a high recurrent rate for varicose veins. So in summary, varicose veins are frequent in the general population. Uh, one quarter of the population has varicose veins about. Progression of reflux and chronic venous insufficiency is very frequent in the population. As you have seen about almost 50% uh, in 13 years, reflux progression may develop from segmental to multi-segmental superficial reflux uh, and not only from proximal to distally, and a high proportion of uncomplicated varicose veins develop skin changes and chronic venous insufficiency within 10 years. Significant risk factors for the progression of varicose veins are skin changes, corona, high body mass index, and poor pleteal vein reflux. So clinically, we always should look also to the feet and to corona flebectatica to identify a population which is on a higher risk for progression of the disease. And during a 13.4 years follow-up period, more than 50% of all chronic venous disease patients have a progression of the disease.
Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Rabe. It's a, a pleasure listening to you. We do have a couple of questions, if that is all right for you to answer them. Um, we have one question from uh, Dr. Disila from Egypt, and he's congratulating you on the great talk. A big question is still debatable between the descending and ascending as it really affects the strategy of treatment between Shiva and Asval. Despite the concept is the same to uh, spare the GSV, yet the theory is totally different. Which theory do you personally stand for? Thank you very much. Yes, it's a very good question. We also looked at looked look to that question also in the Bon Wayne study, and because we had a 6.7 year follow up, and I can tell you that both happens. We could see that having tributary varicose veins was a higher risk for developing of saphenous reflux. And on the other hand side, saphenous reflux only without uh, uh, tributary varicose veins uh, had was also uh, developed also with a high risk uh, of uh, tributary varicose veins in the follow up. So I think both can happen. Uh, however, when we see most of our patients, the population is older, the mean age is more than 50 years, and then a big part of this population has already a complete insufficiency of the great saphenous vein or small saphenous vein and side branches. Uh, so we should uh, develop our concept of treatment on what we see in the patient. Perfectly, thank you so much. Um, there are two more, they're a little bit shorter. <laughs> Um, is there a threshold percentage of varicose vein development in the limb correlating with the progression of to edema in the limb from C2 to C3 in the CAP scale? Yes, there is a correlation, but the correlation is quite weak because the C3 stage, it's uh, very weak itself uh, because we are looking to venous edema, but this is a, a combination of venous pathology and edema. And there are many other reasons in addition which can cause edema, even in a population which has varicose veins, but the varicose veins are not the real reason for edema. Just an example, if you are obese, for instance, you may develop uh, edema. Uh, if you are, if you take uh, drugs like antihypertensive drugs, this may cause edema in your legs. If you are sitting the whole day, you may develop edema with and without varicose veins. So the combination of varicose veins and edema is not always, you know, edema, varicose veins are not always the reason. So there is a correlation, but the correlation is quite weak. Okay. Thank you so much. And um, since we already add, uh, talked about obesity, that also brings us to the third question. Um, since overweight patients are more at risk, is there a motion to introduce dietary education alongside vein therapy? Yes, definitely, uh, because it, uh, obesity, especially body mass index of more than 40, is a very, very high risk factor, not so much for varicose veins, but very much for severe chronic venous insufficiency. We know that those patients may develop ulcers even if they have no venous pathology. And of course, in obese patients and venous findings, it's always uh, um, a dietary uh, issue. Thank you so much. So as um, everybody, the rest of the participants have now seen, we do have an option of a question and answer video. This should appear on the right upper side of your screen. Um, it looks like two little chat windows with a question mark inside where you can um, ask us questions and we will then after the presentation present them um, to our um, scientific members. So thank you very much, Dr. Rabe. It has been a pleasure. And our next up speaker is Dr. Attilio Cavezzi. He will talk um, now. Thank you so much for this presentation. And Dr. Cavezzi, the stage is yours. Yeah, I just want to present Attilio a little bit. 
Attilio is living in the beautiful city of San Benedetto del Tronto in Italy. This is a city with the most palms in Italy, so really a beautiful place to live and enjoy good life. And Attilio is uh, a really specialist in foam sclerotherapy. Therefore, his topic is foam sclerotherapy, as he's one of a world leading specialist in this field. In addition, he is um, the past vice president of UIP for Europe. He is the current chairman of CIRC, Center of Interdisciplinary Research on Compression, and scientific board member of ICC International Compression Club. So thank you, Attilio. The stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uwe. Uh, can you confirm me that you are seeing my screen? Yes, absolutely fine. Okay, perfect. So thanks everybody. Hello everybody. So I thank Mary and for the kind invitation. So my uh, my role is to speak about foam sclerotherapy. Am I advancing my slides? I can, can still see, see the first slide at the moment. I'm trying to advance the slides. Uh, let me check. Mm -hmm. I will restart. Sorry, because it was working. <laughs> Just a second, I restart. Maybe there is something else. OK, I will restart. Can you see it now? It is coming on. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes it now is. we're okay. on the second page. Sorry. Sorry, so that's my disclosure slide. As you can see, I will be a little bit quicker. So when we speak about foam sclerotherapy, we usually refer to Orbach as one of the very first who spoke about foam or froth, let's say. Then some kind of revolution came with Cabrera and finally with Monfrey and the possibility to use a glass syringe to produce, let's say, an extemporary foam for our sclerotherapy. Then uh, we had the luck to publish the first international article about the skeleton foam in duplex guided sclerotherapy. And we understood with Lorenzo Tessari and this new method in 1999 and in 2000, how this uh, new method could have changed, let's say, from the very old sclerotherapy made with liquid to something completely new, which would be called a uh, later foam sclerotherapy and this was a major change let's say we had the possibility to publish the very first results uh, with the duplex guided foam sclerotherapy with the tessari method and that was based on the injection under the ultrasound guidance as you can see the foam was uh, wonderfully replenishing all the vein and that was the final result with the fibers cord after 110 days in follow-up so uh, anyway, since the very beginning, we realized that uh, some recurrence or some recanalization was occurring at six months, as you can see here. And anyway, uh, together with many other friends from Germany, we started to develop some research about foam sclerotherapy, trying to understand how to advance the possibilities of this new method. So we realized that we needed uh, um, small bubbles. We needed, uh, uh, let's say, a long life uh, for our foam to have the best outcome possible. Then we decided to perform some studies from the chemical and physical foam point of view with Lorenzo Tessari, just because we wanted to understand how the materials may interfere in foam sclerotherapy efficacy and safety. That's why we discovered, for example, the differences between air, O2 or CO2, and the CO2 was uh, uh, actually able to reduce the sizes of uh, our bubble, but somehow also the duration was shorter. And we published some uh, uh, preliminary experiences with these uh, variables in foam sclerotherapy. And together with Nick Morrison, we agreed on the fact that CO2 was something useful when we wanted to decrease possible side effects, let's say. Syringes uh, were shown to have a role in producing, let's say, an adequate foam. And as you can see here, for example, a few syringes may give you smaller bubbles 
or longer lasting foam, as uh, you can see from uh, these experiments. Uh, a few syringes have a very small duration, and here you can see, for example, the comparison between a traditional syringe and another one which we prefer to use so that you have a, a dense foam for a quite long time, at least 30 to 60 seconds. It's a variable, but quite dense foam. Other much more important articles came out uh, where they clearly highlighted how a dry foam is very different from what we can, we can call wet foam, where you have a, a, a higher proportion of um, uh, liquid in comparison to air or to gas. And in the syringe, this is what happens, for example, where you have a, a dry foam uh, and a wet foam or liquid at the, the bottom of the syringe, for example. And also through these articles, uh, clearly the authors show the differences uh, in the foam distribution in the bubbles when you use air, which is made mostly of uh, nitrogen or O2 or CO2 again. Then when we looked at foam sclerotherapy complications, we published the article and uh, basically we could uh, understand that they were quite similar to the liquid sclerotherapy complications, apart from a few isolated cases of complications related to foam itself. Together with Ebra Rabe, a few guidelines were issued and somehow um, ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy had a kind of recognition worldwide. And uh, several Anglo-Saxon groups and uh, other groups from uh, all over the world started to publish their evidence about uh, good outcomes at one year, as you can see here from the, for example, from the group of uh, Bradbury. Regrettably, nearly 10 years ago, uh, a few articles started to highlight how duplex guided foam sclerotherapy invariably achieved a lower uh, occlusion rate in comparison to laser radiofrequency or surgery, as you can see from this study, for example, from Rasmussen. If we go to the most more recent literature, uh, this very elegant study from uh, uh, British colleagues uh, shows very clearly that laser was the best in terms of quality of life and quality assessment and somehow foam and surgery had inferior similar outcomes. These are two studies, also a very recent publication, where whatever you want to argue about the possible flows in the foam sclerotherapy methodology, somehow you have to recognize that foam sclerotherapy in these studies had the highest clinical and sound based recurrence, and so the highest need for retreatment. So this means somehow that Foam sclerotherapy, I cannot advance again the, the slides. Can you see other slides moving? Um, no, we are still on the five year follow up of randomized the trial. It, it's stuck again, sorry. I don't know why. <laughs> I tried to go, but in, in, my, in my case, it worked on the uh, lower left side of the PowerPoint presentations. If you click on it, then you see uh, how you can move forward. In my case, I had to do okay. it like this. Yes. Now it's okay now. Okay. So uh, uh, some better outcomes were achieved using what they called endovenous microform. Uh, a patent microfilm. Uh, this is uh, uh, these are the results from an American group, and so they achieved the, the results which were somehow similar to laser and radio frequency. But let's move to the second part of my presentation. To improve the results of foam sclerotherapy, together with Tessari and other friends, we decided to develop. Uh, what we can call a catheter foam sclerotherapy included to my sense and irrigation. In fact, Kurosh Parsi showed in this elegant drawing how we can include a catheter inside the vein and through to my sense we can dramatically reduce the caliber of the vein prior to foam entrance. And this could be very helpful to reduce the significant impact of blood and the blood proteins 
uh, in terms of denaturation of the sclerosant agent. What we know is that the higher the diameter, the higher the recanalization rate when we perform foam sclerotherapy. And that's probably due to blood flow and blood stagnation into the vein. So to reduce somehow this uh, uh, evident influence of the caliber, as you can see also in this elegant study from uh, Toniola and collaborators. So to reduce uh, this evident influence uh, of albumin, of blood and uh, caliber, we thought how to do it through a catheter. Because uh, several studies we have been performing showed that uh, invariably uh, proteins and blood can reduce the impact and the efficacy of uh, um, sclerosant agent on the vein wall. So to make sense was the possibility we highlighted to decrease the size of the vein and so to increase the efficacy and possibly safety of foam sclerotherapy. Because to mention, as you can see from this uh, slide, can significantly reduce the caliber before the foam entrance. You see here an aneurysm of a saphenous vein which is reduced from 24 millimeter in supine position to one millimeter or two millimeter after two mesons. And everybody would agree that sclerosing this vein would be much more complicated than sclerosing this vein. That's possibly the, the final meaning of tumescence. To assess if tumescence can be of help in foam sclerotherapy, we performed this study where we compare three groups and uh, the one group was without tumescence, the other group had a, a tumescence under visual guidance and the third group had a tumescence injected under the ultrasound guidance. As you can see from the clinical point of view, the group with the, the ultrasound guidance had a better outcome and that was uh, even more true when we looked at the duplex outcomes where the occlusion rate was better for the groups with the, the duplex guided to my sense and also when the veins were patent somehow some of the veins had an anti-grade flow and that was an interesting outcome at the end of the day. Together with tumescence, we may use irrigation which permits us to reduce the blood inside the vein again prior to foam entry. So that means that not only we can reduce the caliber of the vein, but also we can reduce the flow and the stagnating blood inside the vein prior to foam entrance. So the combination of these two methods together with the catheter inside the saphenous stem was tested in uh, a prospective clinical uh, trial that we uh, published. So we treated the patient with the great saphenous vein incompetence in, uh, with it, uh, by means of a catheter foam sclerotherapy to mesons and irrigation and phlebectomy for the tributaries. You see here the catheter inside the vein and the two mesons around, and this is the foam which is delivered in the vein after two mesons. So this is the article we published in the European Journal of Vascular and Vascular Surgery three years ago. So we treated very high diameter veins because as average it was nearly eight millimeters. So we were not only masochistic, but we wanted to test this method in larger veins, let's say. And uh, somehow we used seven milliliter of foam per patient. And uh, the clinical recurrence at three years was 5% in this group of patients. And it is interesting to see how when looking at the uh, duplex results, the overall reflux-free great saphenous veins at three years was 96.5%. We had an 89.5.4 percent occlusion rate and some 7.1 percent of the saphenous veins had the non-integrate flow because of the very low caliber and the reduced compliance after the treatment at three years, which are uh, some outcomes, which are outcomes which are comparable to the other uh, techniques we have mentioned, we would be mentioned afterwards by Nick probably. Okay, let's go ahead. Okay, so
So, and uh, let's say that for the very first time, we started to see how the veins can disappear. And that's probably due to the fact that uh, in this case, the, con the, the blood which is contained in the vein prior to the foam entrance is very low. So we mostly achieve fibrosis of the vein and not just thrombosis, what is typical, let's say, of a traditional duplex guided foam sclerotherapy without to mesons and uh, irrigation. Uh, many other authors uh, uh, published similar outcomes uh, in, uh, uh, in different journals. You see this study from Egypt and they achieved very similar outcomes in terms of uh, reflux free uh, great saphenous veins uh, at three years. This is a group from Egypt. You see here from Italy, he compared, Dr. Orsini compared a group uh, with the duplex guided foam sclerotherapy and the catheter foam sclerotherapy. And at 52 months, the catheter foam sclerotherapy had the 73.9% occlusion rate in comparison to the 56.2% occlusion rate with the conventional duplex guided foam sclerotherapy. Uh, the group of uh, Thomas Urbanek also published uh, an interesting paper where also it demonstrated quite good occlusion rate at uh, 18 months, for example, nearly 90% with two mesons and catheter foam sclerotherapy. This was uh, a randomized control trial which compared ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy from Brazil, Dr. Dos Santos, uh, ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy with catheter foam sclerotherapy. And uh, in this case, as you can see, somehow the retreatment uh, uh, rate was higher in the group of uh, the, catheter, the ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy in comparison to the catheter foam sclerotherapy. Uh, this was an elegant, this has been recently published, this is an elegant uh, systematic review and meta-analysis where these authors uh, examined the 62 studies uh, and basically the final outcome of this uh, systematic review and meta-analysis is that uh, you may achieve a higher rate of complete ablation when you use catheter foam sclerotherapy in comparison to ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy and you also get fewer complications using catheter uh, in contrast to the uh, use of uh, traditional ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy. Uh, Paul Thibault and Kuros Parsi published this elegant comment where they clearly highlighted how perivenous tumescent may help to achieve a better outcome when treating veins, especially of larger sites. If we look at complications of this method, as you can see, they are absolutely in the range of all the other techniques. Also because, again, you are using lower amount of foam and also because of uh, the possibility to target, uh, let's say, centimeter by centimeter, the delivery of the foam thanks to the catheter. And uh, last but not least, it is a very cheap method, which may be of interest, especially when you want to spare some money treating a benign disease, which is a, a, a strong tendency to recurrence as uh, Eberhard showed. So to make it short, we should probably move for a from a very elegant technique, which is foam sclerotherapy, to a much newer and possibly more elegant technique, which is catheter foam sclerotherapy. So in conclusion, ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy is effective, versatile, inexpensive and safe. Somehow it, it may show a higher recanalization rate in comparison to the other endovenous thermal ablation techniques, especially in larger veins. When introducing the catheter and when introducing to mesons and the, let's say also irrigation of the vein prior to foam entry, then you may get better outcomes uh, and especially in larger veins and in the longer term, the primary results from our groups and from the following articles which were published seems to be clearly in favor of this technique when we decide to use foam sclerotherapy. Somehow with this technique through catheter and through tumescence and through irrigation, we could probably realize what George Fagan called his dream, the dream of the empty vein technique. And if we empty the vein or reduce the blood to the minimum, we can probably achieve a much better outcome in terms of uh, mid and long term follow up. 
Thanks again, and sorry for the technical problems. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Cavetzi. Very, very interesting. We do have three questions for you as well, if you want to answer them. Yeah. So our first question is, which syringe do you personally prefer for foam preparation? Yeah, so well, I don't like to speak about uh, brands of syringes, but let's say that we could use the low silicon or no silicon syringes. Well, everybody knows that uh, the very first uh, trials we performed were done through Terumo syringes, but also Beckton and Dickinson, the ones discarded, the name is, which have the lowest content of silicon, let's say. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is, is a comment, perhaps. Um, so, um, Dr. Um, Andres, Andres Papau from Poland. So sorry if I pronounce this the wrong way. Um, wants to share his practical experience with the use of physiological gases. Since the time of application, he has observed a much better effect in neurological symptoms. Is that something that you concur with? Well, I mean, uh, as I showed in one slide, Nick Morrison was one of the very first to publish a, a comparative study where he showed uh, lower scotomas and uh, visual disturbances when using CO2 instead of uh, air. Probably it's a matter of quantity because if we use uh, not such a high volume, you may argue that air would be okay, but when you need to use higher volume, possibly using uh, CO2 or CO2 plus O2 could be an option. It could give you a safer profile. There is some discussion about that, so we cannot state that you need it, but you can use it in case. We need more studies, of course, to state something like that. Okay, thank you very much. In the meantime, we've had actually two more questions coming in. Um, again, Dr. Vasila from Egypt congratulates you to an excellent talk. And in his case, pigmentation remains a big issue after foam sclerotherapy. It reduces the concentration, uh, the used volume or compression. What are your tips concerning this issue of pigmentation? What well, pigmentation occurs in traditional foam sclerotherapy, let's say in something like 20% of the cases, it is transient and so on and so on. When using tumescence and irrigation, you remove the reason of pigmentation, which is blood, which creates clots. So on one side, when you are treating the saphenous vein, you get no pigmentation, basically because it's deep and you are using tumescence and irrigation. And I prefer phlebectomy for the majority of my varicose tributaries. But if you need to treat the varicose tributaries with, to, with foam, then the ideal is to reduce the blood inside the vein prior to foam entrance, lifting the limb and possibly using tumescence again. At the end of the day, removing the clots is very important to decrease the later pigmentation rate, and that's important as we all know. Okay, thank you so much. And then one question regarding compression use. Um, after sclerotherapy, should we indicate the use of compression stockings as a prophylactic to prevent a reoccurrence? Here we have two big experts, uh, Eberhard and Giovanni. They edited a lot of articles on yes. this issue, and Giovanni will speak about this probably. So my simple suggestion is yes, when you treat tributaries, you should use compression even when treating saphenous vein, at least for a short time. This is what we can say to reduce side effects. We cannot absolutely say that we improve the outcomes in terms of occlusion rate, but probably there is some evidence that you reduce side effects when using compression class one or class two stockings, for example, especially when treating the varicose tributaries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cavetzi. It has been a pleasure. Um, our next talk will be Dr. Nick Morrison with an overview on thermal and non-thermal ablation. Dr. Uh, Umaya, do you want to add something to this? Yes, uh, it's a special pleasure to welcome Nick. Uh, Nick was until mid of last year UIP World President of Lebology and he is also a past president of the American College of Lebology. Um, he has also uh, a special uh, congress called the Sedona Days. This is an anti-congress of phlebology 
very innovative, very special, and it's a, a dream participating in this anti-Congress of Labology. And finally, he is also the founder of the Wayne Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona. So thank you, Nick, that you participate. Thanks very much, Uwe. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. And this, are my slides up? Yeah. Great. OK, um, we're going to move on from uh, foam to thermal ablation. Uh, that's a picture of the Grand Canyon in my home state of Arizona in the US. It's a spectacular place. And that's my disclosure slide, another picture of the Grand Canyon. Um, there's some historical information that's important uh, if you're going to contemplate doing an ablation, any kind of ablation on the SAFNA system. For example, if the patient has a history of superficial thrombophobitis or DVT in the past, this may technically limit uh, how well you can treat. And if, of course, if there's compromised outflow in the deep system, the superficial system may be the main, uh, main outflow track. Uh, if there's been prior treatment, even visual sclerotherapy can damage the truncal veins and uh, hinder catheter advancement. And if the patient or, or the family has a history of thrombosis, uh, multiple miscarriages, cryptogenic shock, stroke, I'm sorry, uh, workup is possible uh, for thrombophilia that might be important. Uh, to begin with, we examine the patient in the standing position from the groin to the ankle and inspect and palpate the varicosities and telangiectasias. For example, if a patient has some tortuous varicosities in the proximal medial thigh, that may be an indication that this is of pelvic origin rather than saphenofemoral junction origin. We inspect the abdomen to look for enlarged superficial veins, which may indicate a proximal thrombosis or obstruction. We look for healed surgical incisions because this may be uh, a clue to what the previous treatment is. Many patients forget exactly what they've had and uh, even where or which side, so this may be a clue. And uh, watch the patient walk for calf pump dysfunction because as we know, uh, as much as 40% much as of patients with a venous leg ulcer have calf pump dysfunction as opposed to venous uh, incompetence. And I would also say that it's not true that a lower SEEP classification patients are predominantly superficial and a higher SEEP classification C4 to C6 are primarily deep venous disease. And that's why we need a very detailed uh, deep and superficial duplex information. Now, some indications for ablation are signs and symptoms of venous insufficiency. A standing duplex scan performed by a fully qualified sonographer showing a patent vein with reflux in excess of 0.5 seconds. We need to assure that we have a patent deep venous system, a vein that is conducive to catheterization or injection, and adequate patient mobility so we can get these patients up and moving uh, immediately following the procedure so, uh, to reduce the risk of DVT. It's okay if the patient has some deep venous reflux or a history of uh, sclerotherapy or phlebectomy in the past. These are not contraindications. If the patient is on anticoagulation or hormonal replacement, uh, those patients are treated just like everyone else. You might watch them a little more closely for a post-op thromb thrombotic episode. Uh, age is really very minimal uh, restriction, assuming that the patient get, has adequate mobility. A mildly tortuous or large diameter great saphenous veins, those can be uh, uh, treated fairly successfully with some little tricks. Now I want to talk specifically about thermal ablation. That's again another shot of the Grand Canyon. That's uh, the, uh, from the south rim. That's a hike down. Uh, you don't want to do that at the summertime. It's way too hot. So the indications are for incompetent great, small, or accessory saphenous veins, the veins of Giacomini, cranial extensions of the small saphenous vein, occasionally perforators, and tributaries. Where to treat? Generally for thermal ablation, we do not treat much below the knee because of an increased risk of paresthesia or more importantly of dysesthesia. The small saphenous vein, we avoid the most proximal portion because of motor nerves in that area and we don't want to damage those. And for tributaries, the cranial extension of the small uh, saphenous vein can be treated fairly easily if they are not tortuous. 
perforators are technically more difficult, and I would submit that uh, it's in, unlikely or uh, uncommon to re actually require to treat a perforator in the uh, absence of C5 and C6 disease. Now, there are some contraindications, uh, the absolute indications on the left are acute DVT, superficial venous thrombosis, acute infection, and deep venous obstruction. The relative ones on the right-hand side, if you have a very low uh, ABI, some sort of lidocaine sensitivity, pregnancy, these others that you can see on the right side of the screen, those are all relative contraindications. So preoperative assessment includes the signs and symptoms of chronic venous insufficiency, duplex scan with the uh, reflux greater than 0.5 seconds, that is mandatory. And by the way, I put CVI up there. CVI generally refers to C3 to, to C6 patients. Of course, uh, thermal ablation can be used in C2 and C3 patients. If there, it's important to look at an ABI if there's any indication of significant uh, peripheral arterial disease. Uh, we don't use a continuous wave Doppler for screening much anymore, and other physiologic testing are largely uh, uh, for research tools. Now, the uh, various methods of thermal ablation are uh, radio frequency and laser energy, which is electromagnetic energy, and steam. Steam, at least in the U.S., has not uh, experienced much uh, traction. The radio frequencies are, you can see on top, closure fast, vein close, and Olympus. Olympus has, I don't believe, has made it into the U.S., so it's largely uh, European. Uh, and then the laser methods. Initially, there were some lower wavelength lasers. This goes back into the early 2000s. However, uh, since that time, most have churned to higher wavelength lasers. Uh, from 13, 19 up to 1940 and even higher. There's been uh, some changes in fibers. We can use anything from a 100 to a 600 micron fiber. And as I said, there is a recent trend toward higher wavelength lasers. Um, blood is the primary target for those lower wavelength lasers. And uh, uh, the water is a primary target for any laser above 1300 nanometers. That, that way, the vein wall is the direct target and it seems to be somewhat more effective at lower doses and energy doses and uh, fewer complications. So let's see if we can get some of these to work. Uh, no. So um, this is ultrasound guided injection. I'm really sorry this video doesn't work because uh, um, it would be, be very instructive. So this is a needle coming in, local anesthetic. I come all the way down into the vein wall because the uh, nerve supply is in the adventitia and I like to anesthetize that so that I can do the rest of the access painlessly. And then a needle is advanced directly into the vein wall for access. And then a guide wire comes through the vein, through the needle into the vein. That's the guide wire there on the right. One thing to avoid is be sure that you stay in the uh, superficial system because sometimes it's quite easy to put that wire into the deep system. For example, in this case, or on the right hand side, this is a wire that's gone in, into a large uh, parallel trip uh, perforator and you can get into the deep system. So you need very good ultrasound control. And then the, the, a sheath is advanced over the guide wire. Guide wire comes out and the fiber comes through. And again, if I had video, I would show that to you. Disappointing. Um, the position of the tip of the catheter has to be below the saphenofemoral junction. There's some controversy about how low. Some uh, people recently are treating right up to the saphenofemoral junction. Most treat, try to treat below the entrance of the superficial epigastric vein or two to two and a half centimeters below the saphenofemoral junction. And then ultrasound guided tumescent anesthesia, you can see both anterior and posterior. You can do it either in the longitudinal view or in the trans transverse view. And then uh, this is the longitudinal view. Uh, this is a very sensitive area up near the saphenofemoral junction. So you need good tumescent anesthesia beyond the catheter tip, both anteriorly and posteriorly. And then this is uh, the transverse view. Again, you see a halo effect around the uh, vein itself. 
And then laser activation does produce bubbles, as, as does the radio frequency. Uh, when we were doing foam, we used to worry about bubbles uh, where, and where bubbles went. We then did some experiments using a trans thoracic echo and a, a trans cardiac or transcranial Doppler done at the same time of these procedures. In fact, you find bubbles in the heart and then on into the central circulation in the presence of a right to left shunt, even following laser or RF. We do do a, a duplex scan immediately afterwards to be sure that you have injured only the superficial system and not the deep system. And then we carry out those patient interviews, examinations and duplex scans out beyond the time. We follow patients pretty carefully. Compression is used always after these procedures. I have to say that the, uh, the evidence for this is not great, although the patients will tell you routinely that they're more comfortable with compression than not. And typically we use 20 to 30 or 30 to 40 millimeter compression hose. Um, I think it's very important to treat the incompetent distal saphenous veins, the tributaries, and persistently incompetent perforators to try to avoid the, the high rate of recurrence uh, in the saphenous vein. Adjunctive treatment is almost always used. Ambulatory forvectomy, for example, for large uh, bulging tributaries, uh, uh, varicosities. Um, the, uh, it, this can be done at the same time as the thermal ablation, or you can delay it. There is some evidence that the rate at which you will need to do phlebectomy is decreased if you delay the phlebectomy. However, most patients would prefer to have uh, as much work as, as possible done in one sitting, uh, so they're generally happier if you, do, uh, if you do phlebectomy concurrently. And then ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy is a, a very critical addition to thermal ablation uh, almost always. You can do a surgical ligation of the perforator if you need to, although uh, it's been well shown that most of the time if the incompetent perforator is first treated with a truncal ablation, very often uh, as much as 80% of the time the perforator will regain competence. You can do subfascial endoscopic perforator surgery to get rid of those or a powered phlebectomy. And then finally, a surface sclerotherapy or visual sclerotherapy. As following traditional surgical methods, I think it's necessary to treat any remaining, remaining portion of the uh, uh, incompetent veins, typically either with injection sclerotherapy and or phlebectomy. Results are, are quite good for RF. Generally, it's in the 90 to 96 percent range at two to five years and with laser, uh, 90 to 95 percent at one to five years. With these higher wavelength lasers and radio fibers, we can deliver energy circumferentially uh, with fewer complications and side effects than with the lower wavelength lasers. And now with these higher wavelength lasers, the results and uh, safety is essentially the same as radio frequency. I would caution you to beware of uh, the use of uh, reuse of laser fibers. Most of these are single use only. You can cleave them and reuse them, um, but uh, they are more prone to fracture uh, if you're reusing those. And in the States anyway, uh, those, those are, catheters are labeled single use only, and you could be in some medical legal jeopardy if you uh, reuse them. There are some uh, interoperative complications uh, if, uh, as I mentioned, if you're reusing or even a brand new laser fiber can fracture and you can inadvertently leave um, a, a portion of the catheter behind, there's, uh, there's a two centimeter segment of catheter that's left behind. We recognize this when we pull it out um, and then uh, we left it, discussed it with the patient. Some patients would prefer to have it removed. Uh, some would, uh, would not, would just see what happens. This is a pretty inert, piece of material in the subcutaneous tissue and it's uh, unlikely to cause any significant problems. They tend not to migrate. If there's transient heat during a thermal ablation, uh, you can add more to mesentanesthesia. If, there's a, if you're having technical trouble advancing either the wire or the catheter, the very first maneuver is to straighten the leg. That will almost always allow you to 
to pass the fiber or the wire. Now, sometimes you can use external compression or manipulation, and even a second site, cephalad to the first site, may be necessary to get by a particularly uh, stenotic or, uh, or tortuous segment. Um, other complications can include DVT. The re rate after thermal ablation is probably around 1%. And I say probably because if you were to scan patients very carefully ever after every single thermal ablation that you do, you're going to find probably closer to a 4 to 5% incidence of DVT. Most of those, however, are going to be clinically insignificant. And so it's, uh, it's even questionable whether you need to look for a DVT. It's estimated that you would need to do some 5,000 scans after thermal ablation to find one clinically relevant DVT. Uh, there's something called paste or he hit, which is a thrombus extension coming through the saphenofemoral junction. If it's like this, these can just be uh, watched, but if it's further into the common femoral vein, then uh, anticoagulation may be necessary. Now, if you can picture this, I have a wonderful picture. This is video, but it's not working. Um, this, is a, this is a thrombus extension coming well into the common femoral vein. This is a, 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 a laser fiber that has been inserted. Nothing else has been done. There's been no tumescence added. And I see this thrombus that is just waving in the, uh, in the common femoral vein. It's a very disconcerting. Uh, we went ahead and uh, anticoagulated the patient and treated it, but uh, very disconcerting to see, see that waving at you on, on scan. Uh, Post-op paresthesia is somewhat uh, common, particularly after RF, but it's uh, if you use uh, well-placed in, in the saphena sheath, an adequate volume of local anesthetic, you will reduce this. Uh, most of these, however, these paresthesias will likely resolve. I have seen an occasional patient who has a painful dysesthesia, and uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's an unhappy patient. So that's, a, again, a reason we stay above the uh, mid-calf so that we reduce the likelihood of a uh, saphenous vein, a saphenous nerve, or in the case of a small saphenous vein, a, a, a sural nerve injury. Skin burns are extremely uncommon and just lower wound care. Um, what happens if the, if the endovenous thermal ablation doesn't work? Well, you can repeat the, the endovenous thermal ablation, perhaps with a different uh, energy source, um, but sometimes that's technically challenging to do. So follow-up foam sclera therapy is a great use in uh, closing those patent segments uh, following thermal ablation. There are some non-thermal, non-tumescent techniques which have been developed over the last few years. That, by the way, is a place called Canyon de Chez in the northeast part of, of my home state of Arizona. It's, a, it's on the Navajo Reservation. It's a beautiful place. So uh, we're going to talk about these tumescentless ablation techniques. Uh, in so-called NTNT or non-thermal, non-tumescent. One of the first ones is ultrasound-guided foam sclerotherapy. In the States, we have a, a manufactured foam, so you can use that, or you can use a physician compounded foam. Uh, I, I, um, Atelio has already gone through that pretty successfully, so I won't spend much time there. Um, there's something called MOCA or mechanochemical ablation. The, uh, that's a, a, a small wire, and I'll show it to you in a second, a small wire that's inserted and rotates rapidly while injecting liquid sclerosant. And so finally, cyanoacrylate adhesive. So what's new about foam? I'm going to go through this very quickly. Indications are essentially the same as for thermal ablation, as you can see. And oh boy, I'll, I'll, I wish this phone, this uh, video would work. But uh, at any rate, so this is a reservoir and I keep my physiologic gas. We, uh, Atilio talked a little bit about physiologic versus room air. If you're using l very low volumes, probably it doesn't make any difference as far as complications or side effects for r using room air. But if you're using anything more than that, it's uh, very nice to use a, a physiologic gas. This is 
uh, CO2, O2 in a 35-65% combination. It's kept in a pediatric bamboo bag, which is impermeable, so I know I have uh, the same mixture that I put in coming back out. And then we can, as uh, Tilio said, we connect a three-way, two non-siliconized syringes are attached. So there's one cc of liquid sclerosant. I'll uh, bring out four cc's of uh, the gas and then mix them through the three-way to uh, produce the foam. And uh, I, I usually have a sonographer with me doing the ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy. The reason being, uh, if I have somebody, I can, uh, I can, uh, the whole point is to inject the freshest foam possible. And so if I'm just making foam until the sonographer acquires a target vein, then I can inject very fresh foam so that the bubbles are the smallest and, and most dense. Um, there are a couple of different techniques. This is the long technique that I like, uh, where I come down the long axis of the probe with the needle so that I can see the needle all the way to the target. This is done usually if you're doing it by yourself. This comes down the short axis, so you see the needle when it arrives at the target here. And let me see if I have this other one back here. And it, it, it didn't work, but at any rate, uh, if you if you go to the other side or have something that's a little bit uncomfortable, rather than have you turn and have the patient turn, just come from the other side. And you can see instead of coming from this side, that needle is coming from this side. You can uh, do the injections in the transverse mode or the longitudinal mode. This, this would show it if the video worked. So um, it's, uh, uh, it's an easier injection if you do it transverse than it is longitudinal. It's just an easier to get in. And then for the small saphenous vein, of course, the patient is uh, prone, come down the long axis of the probe and you can see the needle all the way to the target. Uh, this is a uh, foam sclerotherapy for reticular veins. This is a visual technique, but if you're having trouble getting rid of some um, spider veins or a cluster of spider veins, or uh, there's an obvious reticular vein, what you can do is an ultrasound guided injection. So these are pretty small, that's a uh, one millimeter or less, but if you can get into them, then it's a very efficient way to take care of the problem uh, by injection. Ultrasound guided foam is excellent for neovascularity that we see following mostly uh, surgical extirpation of the great saphenous vein. Sometimes we see it on a rare occasion following the thermal ablation. Uh, you can inject one of those veins and it just goes in all of the veins and it's a great way to take care of that. There's a manufactured foam in the US called Verathena. It is, uh, uh, it, it's used, um, it's now reimbursed by insurance companies here in the States. Uh, it is a, a very low nitrogen, less than 1% nitrogen. Again, CO2O2 combination with 1% polydocanol uh, and uh, works well. Um, MOCA, this is the mechanical occlusion, chemically assisted. So again, I show you that little wire that's in there that rotates very rapidly and uh, denudes the endothelium. And then uh, you're injecting liquid foam, I'm sorry, liquid sclerosant into the vein as you treat. Uh, and some reports that report, they're not a lot, mostly from the, from the US and from uh, the Netherlands, uh, claiming a uh, greater than 94% success rate at one year as far as occlusions. The indication is the same as for any other endovenous uh, device. Um, you can treat anything straight, but even some tortuous because you can steer that wire. You can go ex intrafascial or extrafascially, so real near the skin because you're not using heat and you don't have a risk of nerve injury or burn injury. Um, the advantages are that you can uh, go below the knee safely, get in the extrafascial veins safely. Uh, you can treat C5 and C6 patients all the way down to the malleoli, and uh, you don't need tumescence or heat. Uh, contraindications for any person, patient who has had a uh, superficial venous thrombosis. The problem is that wire, that rotating wire, will snag on the uh, sonicii and um, you have to shut the machine off immediately or you'll do a stripping procedure without anesthesia, which is not too pleasant. Uh, large veins are probably not best treated with MOCA. 
and then finding cyanoacrylate as adhesive. This is the venous seal procedure where you insert a catheter and then uh, compress the saft and femoral junction and then put droplets of adhesive. So for a, uh, say a 35 or 40 centimeter segment of saphenous vein, you will use perhaps 1.2 to 1.6 milliliters of this adhesive. So very small quantities. And you can see it just drops all the way down with compression to spread it out and to keep it from going proximally. This adhesive is very viscous. And so the chance that it will uh, embolize or ex is extremely small, particularly on that first injection, which is held for four minutes, uh, three minutes to be sure that uh, it, that it doesn't uh, embolize. So in conclusion, the, the traditional surgical methods and the newer methods um, are generally safe. Uh, intra and post-operative complications are infrequent and usually less seen, seen less frequently than with these endovenous ablation procedures than with traditional surgical procedures. I will say that uh, proximal truncal, surgical, thermal, or chemical ablation alone will ultimately fail unless one is co committed to careful follow-up and adjunctive treatment. I think that the practitioner and the patient will be left with unsatisfactory results. And I'm, I enjoyed uh, Dr. Rabe's presentation uh, where progression is certainly a, a factor. Uh, that's a, a new text that's coming out by a colleague that every all of us know. Uh, Joe Sigmund, this is an excellent uh, venous ultrasound text. Sorry for the blatant uh, promotion and uh, thank you very much. That's up in the Monument Valley in Arizona. Thank you very much. Dr. Morrison, Dr. Morrison thank you very you much. And um, great presentation, an amazing picture of Arizona. Arizona. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know where I will go to holiday next time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we do have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. We have one question from Dr. De Jesus Leal from Mexico. Um, he asks if you suspend the anticoag uh, anticoagulants the day before the ablation and resume them then the day after. Never. The answer is never. I'm a general surgeon by background. I perform many sur general surgical procedures in a fully anticoagulated patient. If you use careful technique, uh, you, it's rare to have any problem uh, with uh, bleeding. Uh, you, you, patient may perhaps bruise a little bit more, but I never take them off. I think it's more dangerous to take the patient off anticoagulation uh, than it is to just leave them through the procedure. Okay, thank you so much. And then we have a question from Mr. Bankers from Albuquerque. Um, he uh, mentions a great lecture, and you have mentioned relative contraindications. Could you comment on the elevated BMI? Yeah, um, as, as Eberhardt pointed out, uh, BMI is, uh, an elevated BMI is, can even be considered a contraindication to treatment of, with endovenous ablation. The reason being the results are unlikely to be satisfactory. So we, uh, we there's a paper that's just coming out or come out that in excess of a BMI of 40, uh, the chance that you will improve uh, either the skin changes or the edema uh, are very little. And so it's almost not worth treating those patients with, with the thermal ablation, with the endovenous ablation procedure. Okay. And then we have a question from uh, Mr. Font. Is it always mandatory um, to use the tumor sense anesthesia in thermal ablation? Uh, I would consider it absolutely mandatory for, for a couple of reasons. If you're do the, doing these procedures under local, obviously you have to be, have tumescent anesthesia. If you are doing these procedures under general anesthesia, you still will reduce the incidence of perivascular injury, tissue injury, by using tumescent anesthesia. So it's more effective and it's safer to use uh, tumescence. Okay. Thank you so much. Now we have another question from Egypt. Um, does the tip catheter positioning more proximally flush to the CEV increase the possibility of an EJYT occurrence? <laughs> and is there a different incidence between thermal and non-thermal hit? 
if, uh, well, to answer that last part, there probably isn't much difference between uh, thermal and non-thermal in terms of the uh, number of those post-ablation uh, uh, thrombus extensions that you will see. Again, those are, um, those are, I look at those as, as almost a uh, uh, not clinically relevant uh, finding. Um, it, it is very rare to see those embolize. And if they do, they will become clinically apparent. So I don't look for those just, uh, just to try to identify them. The earlier you do an ultrasound post at post uh, ablation procedure, the more likely you are to find those. And if you wait uh, a week or 10 days or longer before that first ultrasound, you will find them much less frequently. So th those, those, again, I think those are uh, it, the clinically clinical relevance of those thrombus extensions have been exaggerated. Okay, thank you so very much, Dr. Morrison. And um, now we have our next Subject, Dr. Giovanni Mosti will present compression after procedures. I believe uh, Mr. Maya will do the introduction. Um, Mr. Maya, you are still, your microphone is still on mute. All right. Um, Dr. Giovanni Mosti is a vascular surgeon working in the beautiful city of Lucca in Tuscany. This is the area where Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo were working and living. And uh, Giovanni is the current ICC president since 2012. ICC is International Compression Club, and he is also a past president of the European Venus Forum. For me personally, Giovanni is a little bit like Michelangelo of compression. Therefore, I'm looking forward to his presentation. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, Uwe. I don't know if you are hearing me. Yes, we hear you. OK, so thank you very much for your uh, spectacular introduction, I would say. Uh, I certainly don't deserve the comparison with Michelangelo, but thank you so much. And thank you so much to you, especially, and to Medi for your kind invitation, even if the uh, topic I have is uh, one of the most slippery topics in phlebology and unfortunately I'm sorry to say the people are listening that uh, while uh, the, the previous presenter gave you a lot of information and of, of certainties I will give you a lot of doubts but I hope to clarify in some way this topic. So I have the same problem as Attilio had why using compression after varicose vein procedure? Because we compress the treated veins or the vein tract in case of surgical procedure, and so we will have a thromb less thrombus formation, higher occlusion rate, and less bleeding. We will compress all the leg veins, and we will have less DVT and less phlebitis, and we will compress the surrounding tissue of our treated veins, and so we will have less hematoma, less inflammation, less pain, and less pigmentation. And this is how the reported effect of compression after vein procedure, reduction of hematoma and edema, reduction of pain and discomfort, improvement of result in terms of occlusion after uh, endovenous procedure, reduction of phlebitis and DVT, and reduction of recurrence through reduction of neovascularization. How to compress the vein? This is a very important point because we know that at tight level, the venous pressure, the intravenous pressure is about 30 to 60 millimeter of mercury and compression must come close or exceed these values to occlude the veins. And this is not possible with the last stocking that are the most used compression device after vein procedure because they will never exert a, pre a compression pressure of 30 to 60 millimeter at thigh level. So only with strong compression, we can occlude the intrafascial veins. And I want to remind you that it is not necessary to use inelastic bandages. They were very used in the past. They are very 
uh, I think uh, not, not anymore or very poorly used at the present time, but a very strong compression can be exerted by a kind of eccentric compression, like in this case, uh, uh, firmly stick to the skin by plasters and by a very simple um, bandage. And then, and then we can overlap a, over these a thigh length stocking with waist attachment. And you can see here, we put under the eccentric compression device our uh, probe and we can measure the, the, the pressure exerted by this system. And also with this system, you have a very strong pressure of 50, 60 millimeter of mercury when the patient stands up. So even with a stocking, if you use an eccentric compression, some kind of eccentric compression, you can have a very strong pressure. You can also use adjustable compression wraps, even if uh, also this is not really fashionable. I am very happy to show you this slide because a lot of people believe that uh, it is impossible to compress the vein, the vein at thigh level. And this uh, standing MRI clearly shows that the veins at thigh level can be compressed. Look at this vein here and look at here uh, with the eccentric compression firmly stuck to the skin. The vein is completely compressed. And even at growing level, you know that a lot of people don't believe that uh, the great saphenous vein or the small saphenous vein can be compressed at the joint, at the, at the femoral toplite, um, sorry, um, saphenous, uh, saphenous femoral junction or saphenous popliteal junction, but this is possible and this is clearly shown by this uh, magnetic resonance image. Unfortunately, we have a huge distance from this sparse reported effect and the literature data on clinical benefit, even starting from how to compress the veins, because I tried to show you that a very strong compression pressure is necessary. But if you look at the systematic review of this topic, you see here one uh, um, systematic review in 2015 uh, these authors were uh, able to identify seven randomized controlled trials, but they stated that the quality and heterogeneity of the studies precluded a meta-analysis, and there is a little quality open qua uh, which kind of recommendation regarding uh, the kind of compression we need to use. And the same group published another systematic review two years later. In this time, the um, the, the uh, identified studies were 34, so much higher number of studies, but once again, uh, lack of evidence as to the optimal strategy for compression due to the fact that at least 14 different compression products were used with at least six different pressure in seven different regimes. So you can understand the mess we have in this field. And this review, unfortunately, reflect what we have uh, published, what we, the published data, because if you look at the publication, we have papers reporting everything and it's opposite. So in some paper, you see that strong compression is better than mild compression. In some paper, you see that mild compression is better than strong compression. In some paper, you see that mild compression is better than no compression or even a milder compression or even there is no difference between compression and no compression. These are some studies. I want to go very quickly through these. Uh, I, I want to show you that in this study, strong compression is better than mild compression, but these are old studies and uh, uh, regards mainly flush ligation and stripping or endovenous laser ablation with old devices. Uh, it is also um, important to, uh, to observe that these are the only studies where compression pressure was measured. And when compression measure was measured and you are going for flush ligation and stripping or uh, endovenous laser ablation with all device, the strong compression is better than low compression. But this is also the opposite. Uh, mild compression is better than strong compression. Same right of side or unwanted effect with, uh, with uh, stocking compared to inelastic bandages. 
but better tolerability. So why using strong strong compression if the side or unwanted effects are the same? Then now, at a more recent time, strong compression is not anymore considered. There is no not any more studies uh, including strong compression as comparator. And we have a just comparison between mild compression and nothing or mild compression and even mild compression. And this is a pity because as you can see here, this lady was submitted to endovenous laser ablation of both legs and she received a very strong compression. One leg was bandaged by me and one leg was bandaged by Hugo Parch. And you can see that the only problems the lady had uh, were in the non-compressed uh, area of the leg because in the compressed area, there is no side effect. Now, coming to recent times uh, uh, and, and going uh, uh, still with this comparison between mild uh, or mild compression or, 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 or a little bit higher compression, you see here that in a study published by Attilio Cavezzi, who compared the Struva uh, 23 and Struva 35 uh, millimeter mercury, he was able to show that with the Struva 35, the outcomes are better in terms of less symptoms, less tissue easing, each, uh, tissue healing, and less edema. And uh, unfortunately, we have also studies where compression important is completely denied. Uh, you see here the study from Amel Desnos, uh, still with the formuscular therapy. Uh, she reported that compression is not effective in reducing thrombophlebitis, inflammation, pain, and pigmentation and matting. But I need to uh, draw your attention the fact that she used a very low amount of foam, low, very low uh, spares and concentration. Uh, the uh, the um, compliance with this study was very poor. And so it, it was compression versus no compression or no compression versus no compression. And what about compliance? And what about uh, sample size that is not uh, considered. Then we have also some reports from uh, meetings, not publication. And you see here that uh, Peter Luga reports that uh, uh, performing ASVAL uh, stocking is not necessary or compression is not necessary. But again, he measured the considered a stocking exerting 18 millimeter mercury at ankle level that means uh, five or seven millimeter mercury at high level, prescribed just for one day, and one group kept on with compression for seven days, and the other group removed compression after uh, one day, and so there is no difference between the two groups. But once again, are we speaking about compression versus no compression, or we are speaking about no compression without uh, versus no compression? And uh, the last one, Morin's, in favor of no compression after Ebla with the same problems, uh, stockings uh, worn only during the day, uh, stocking uh, no compression at all, or uh, only for one, for, for one day. So uh, no difference between groups after 28 uh, days, but we don't have any data in the first seven days. And this is the crucial time to have unwanted effect because certainly Pain is reported by patient in the first days and not certainly after 28 days. And again, compression at tight level is less than 10 millimeter mercury and only during the day. So I don't think this is a compression therapy. I don't want to go through all these studies because there are a lot. And as I told you, uh, every, every study reports something and it's opposite. So I want to go just for the very last studies the last three studies published in 2019 and 2020. And you see here, for instance, in this uh, Cometa study, uh, they reported that uh, compression is uh, advantageous in terms of pain reduction, especially if uh, um, phlebectomies were performed. But you see that on the other hand, uh, this study and the following study uh, dealing with uh, radio frequency, they reported that uh, the compression is or, or 
anyway, no compression is not inferior to compression. That is also very difficult to understand. But anyway, these are not inferiority study and non superiority study. So in this case, no compression and, and compression is the same. And in this study, is this study, the last one to just just published again uh, the role of, comp of compression after radio frequency ablation is doubtful because the, the authors were not able to uh, uh, report a, a statistically significant difference between the group who received compression and the group who didn't receive compression. So my conclusion is that the, this topic is extremely confusing, but it is also true that many papers are burdened with several methodological flaws. And one of the most important is that medical compression stocking exert, if you don't use any eccentric compression device, exerts only 10 to 8 to 8 to 10 millimeter mercury at tight level, and this is not enough to occlude the veins. So nothing or almost nothing was compared with nothing. Many papers are burdened with several methodological flaws, as I told you, because only in a few studies the sample size was calculated. But when you are going for this uh, small difference, minimal difference, because we are speaking about uh, no compression or a compression of uh, 10, 8, 6 millimeter mercury, maybe a huge number are necessary to get the statistical significance. And then uh, Kairos very recently uh, pointed out two very important points. One is the issue of exclusion criteria because in many studies, the complicated patients are excluded. For instance, in the last two studies I showed you, in the Philia studies, 40% of people, of patients were excluded, and in this on Witke study, 45% of patients with risk factors were excluded. So doubts remain regarding the value of compression therapy in many patients excluded from these studies. And last but not least, the last studies are non-inferiority studies, but the main problem with non-inferiority studies is always how to specify an appropriate non-inferiority margin. But honestly, we need to say that if many published papers on compression have major flaws, they report nice results uh, without any doubt, also with low compression or no compression. But in these studies, I would like to have information on different veins, different procedures, different patients, and different surgeons. Because I think you will agree that treating these veins with a diameter of 16 millimeter, uh, uh, diameter of 16 millimeter is not the same that treating this vein with a diameter of uh, uh, 3.4 millimeter, no tributaries, just uh, spider veins. Different procedure because uh, certainly procedure pr more prone to produce hematoma pain and inflammation. For instance, flush ligation and stripping that is uh, quite neglected in this study, but it is uh, still the most performed uh, vein procedure in the world. Form sclerotherapy of the trunk and the varices with high concentration and high volumes. Old laser machines if we perform phlebectomies, and there are procedures less prone to produce hematoma pain and inflammation, for instance, the asphalt uh, method, the small branches avulsion, sclerotherapy without tributary treatment, low concentration and low volumes, radio frequency, new laser devices, and glue. And we have different patients, as was very elegantly pointed out by Kairos, because are we treating asymptomatic patients with just varicose veins without any symptoms? Are we treating patients in C4, C6 classification? Are we treating patients with a long story of CVD? Are we treating patients with previous phlebitis? You see that the difference between this group of patients is huge, and we should have information on all these uh, patients we are treating. And last but not least, the surgeons, because these studies and, and my previous speaker 
in this webinar today are excellent uh, surgeons and also the study obviously are published by excellent studies, excellent surgeons. For instance, here uh, are two legs uh, operated by what I call very important surgeons, but there are also other surgeons. So the surgeons that my friend Achillio calls the Zorro surgeons, and in this case, I'm sure that everybody would like to receive a very strong bandage. So I want to come to my conclusion and I want to start to give some certainties despite, despite of contrasting and often, often opposing data, the great majority of surgeons still apply some form of compression. And I was very happy to hear today Attilio and Nick that still use compression after their procedure and they are certainly excellent surgeons. And uh, this is very clear for this uh, study published again by Arsheka. He performed a survey of members of Vascular Society of Great Britain and in Ireland, and almost all surgeons, even if using different uh, uh, compression system, are all of them using compression. My conclusion, we don't have evidence or we have just a few evidence that compression type vein is possible and also that when we measure compression, a strong compression is more effective than a low compression in preventing unwanted effects after vein surgery. And don't forget, I want to stress this, this point again, that you can have a strong compression with eccentric compression device and elastic stockings. You don't need to apply strong inelastic bandages if you are not used to use strong inelastic bandages. And uh, suggestions because due to this discrepancy and due to all these poor quality studies, we cannot give a recommendation. But my point of view is that if you need to treat large veins with traditional surgery or old laser machine, or foam sclerotherapy using high volumes and high concentration every time when performing phlebectomies. And uh, this is not, not nice to say, but anyway, if the surgeon is not a very important surgeon, strong compression for six days followed by elastic stocking for two weeks. And uh, if when you use new laser machine or radio frequency or, or foam sclerotherapy at low volume and low concentration or glue without phlebectomies, streaking small veins. And if the surgeon is a very important surgeon, low compression is maybe enough. Keep on firm compression for 24 hours and then elastic stocking for two weeks. This is my last slide, and I couldn't end with uh, this without this slide. If a man will begin with the certainties, he shall end in doubts. But if he will be content to begin with doubts, he shall end with certainties. And I hope they will uh, be uh, the same for you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Moses. Very interesting. We do have um, questions. Um, so first of all, thank you um, for your presentation. Um, and do you have, um, do you use compression after all in the venous procedures? Does it depend on the CIP class in your opinion? No, no, we, uh, it doesn't depend on the CIP. We, we use compression after every procedure. In our clinic, we perform foam sclerotherapy, flush ligation and stripping, and uh, laser ablation. And after the three procedures, we always use compression. Uh, I want to remind that uh, uh, compression is not difficult to apply. If you just apply this uh, cotton roll, so you stuck the cotton roll to the skin with some plaster and you put the stocking on, you have a very strong pressure when the patient stands up, and this is more than enough to have a very good results. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. And the second one, um, how do you make an effective educational plan in a healthy subject to use compression to improve their quality of life? 
So, uh, you know, uh, it, is, it is strange that uh, every time we speak about compression, uh, a lot of people is afraid of compliance or education of the patient. Maybe I live in a, in a lucky, uh, in a lucky country because, uh, you know, Italians are, are very famous in the world because they don't like discipline. But I would say that in our field, when I apply a compression device, uh, our people are very compliant. So I really don't understand the problem with compliance. Uh, I, I saw that this is a problem. Maybe this is a problem in hot countries, but it is difficult for me to respond because it is not my 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 experience to see patient uncompliant. Uh, they maybe they claim that they are not comfortable. They they don't like certainly to be compressed for a long time, but nobody remove compression unless I remove compression. Thank you very much. These have been the questions so far. Thank you all so much. It's been an amazing event. Very interesting to listen to. Um, Uwe Meyer still has one um, last addition, I believe, to add. Mr. Meyer, at the moment I cannot hear you. I'm mute. Yes. <laughs> Uwe, unmute yourself. You have to turn on the microphone, yeah. Yeah, all right. Sorry for this. Sorry, sorry. You can hear me now? All right. Okay, first of all, I would thank all of you for your participation and for your passion for compression. A special thanks for David Reich, Valerie Smelin, Jan Arthur Kunz and their teams. And finally, I would like to give a special recommendation for the next webinar this Sunday. It is um, the special webinar for Sergio, by Sergio Giannisini, Food for Veins, at 4 o'clock p.m. And one of the presenters will be also Attilio Capezzi with a special topic, adjustable compression devices, like, for example, Circuit from Medi. And uh, therefore, this will be a very interesting webinar. Try it, you will enjoy it. And they are also famous speakers and key opinion leaders involved. Thank you very much for your Uwe, participation. Uwe, this is Nick. Can I say something? Yes, of course. Mm. Sorry, I, I was seeing a patient, so I just had to come back in. Um, I just want to let everybody know that the technical difficulties of, of, with my video were my fault. Maybe you can have anything to do with it. I just couldn't make them work. So <laughs> I don't want anybody to think that. that oh, problem. thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Nick. That's very David, good. that was for you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nick. And I really appreciate being a part of this. Uh, this um, very, uh, it's humbling to be a part of this group. Yeah, thanks for participating. It was great to have you and also great we overcome all the technical issues we had. And I hope it was a nice event also for the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to all. Yeah, bye bye all. Bye-bye. Hopefully, hopefully we will see live uh, next time. Yes. <laughs> this is our all hope. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Mm? Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Better with a glass of wine, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it is even better. Even better. We, we miss go. this. We miss this. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks. Bye-bye.